Okay, this is my second attempt at making this video. Uh, my dog ran off. He's at the dog park, and uh, he was outside the dog park, so I had to go get him. This is Murphy, by the way, just so you guys know. Hey, Murphy! Murphy! Say hi to everybody! Okay, so anyways, I'm at, I'm at the dog park here with Murphy. It's pretty dead. I mean, everyone's out doing whatever. Um, but I wanted you... Uh, I took this time to kind of look at where I was a year ago. You know, it's Memorial Day, or uh, actually it's Labor Day. It's the end of the summer. Um, maybe look at where you were three months ago, Memorial Day, and see how far you've come in the, these uh, this three months. You know, it's summer. You know, I've got this thing where um, whenever I hear some of uh, some artists from um, two years ago, when, I, when all this stuff was happening in my life, I can't hear those songs right now. Uh, I mean, I can now, but for a while I couldn't hear the songs. It would remind me of that awful summer that I had when, when I was going through my little ordeal with, with my narc. But, um, but I'm here now, and, and you know things progress. If you know, if you get stronger, if you watch videos and participate in online support, read, listen to YouTube videos. I say watch them. You can listen to them. I listen to YouTube videos a ton when I'm um, when I'm retiring at night. Um, I was listening actually to a YouTube video today, and I forgot how good this guy is. Uh, his name is uh, Quinn Holiday, and he's under the uh, YouTube channel as uh, ASSC Direct. And he does this thing where um, he's just he's got he's really he's really studied it. He has a lot of experience, um, and he has a different perspective than Dana, who I also think is uh, an incredible expert as well. But he was talking about this thing, and I think a lot of us forget this, but. You know, you know when the narc discards us, or, or if you've had this situation, you know they present this image like they're with this other person, or they're happy now. Now that they don't have you in their life, they flaunt the new supply. Uh, you know, if it's a new woman or whatever. In my case, I didn't have that happen, so I can't relate to a lot of what you guys are saying, but I can relate to some of the things that narcs do, and that's is, and and, and that is this, um, this false image, this. Uh, this illusion that they create and so what what Quinn says is that a lot of the times yes I'm really live Kwin <laughs> you, you actually got me live um, so what 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 happens is a lot of the times is that um, we think that the narcs are um, having this great life and they're under their, their new supply and we've been discarded and it hurts it hurts a lot but what's happening he said most of the time and I tend to believe this and I'm telling you this because I didn't have this happen so I can't really relate to it as much but you know when when you hear your narc is with a new a, a new person or whatever you know if they had a good with you if they got a lot of supply from you if you were you bent over backwards and, and did things for you they're probably hurting right right now but don't don't pick up the phone and, and call them or anything. They're hurting because they don't have that supply that they had in you. See, what happened was is you changed and you became more of a problem as opposed to a helper. The perfect supply for a narc is somebody who's almost like a slave, somebody who's willing to do anything, and most importantly, believe the illusion. The narc says, "Hey, I'm the greatest tennis player ever," instead of you saying, "Well, I think you you know you might, I think there's somebody on TV that I saw that was maybe at the Olympics that was a little bit better." They don't want that type of person. They want a person that says, hey, you are great. You are, yeah, and you play tennis. Now, the thing is, in a healthy relationship, you can do that to a certain extent, but, but the narc takes it to limits, right? They test boundaries. They, they want you to say that all the time. They, they don't live in reality um, in many cases um, when it comes to the illusion. So I just wanted to get that out there um, and just check in with you guys here for the next 15 or 20 minutes. Um, yes, I'm, there's Jersey Steph, yes, Josh, uh, that's, that's me, I'm, I'm live here. Robin, I'm live with you too. Um, it's cutting you out, huh? Yeah, sometimes it, uh, we can have a bad feed, but it looks like we're building up a pretty good, um, audience here. Um, I show seven people, I've had them up to 35 before, but, uh, you know, for a Sunday afternoon, this is good, and then people are going to watch this video. So if you're watching this video now, and I'm, and there's, there's not any the word live is up at the top then you are not watching it live but um the people right now uh i am watching it live with so it's, it's hard to kind of understand that um so yeah so it's a great sunday afternoon look at where you were a year ago even okay you know 
Um, and here's the thing you may not realize. You're, you've changed, you know, if you're around regular people, well, let's look at it this way. Um, how can you tell if you've changed? Well, number one, you'll feel better, right? You'll feel different. But a lot of the change that you do is noticed by a lot of people that are regulars around you. Now, if you're like me, the regulars around you, you kind of, um, when you had a relationship with a narc, chances are you both had the same friends because the narc will isolate you. They'll get you to, um, you know, you will do things together, right? Because the narc likes to use you as an emotional regulator. So a lot of the friends that we had together um, were also married couples. And so I lost a lot of the friendships that I had. I, I, well, I, and, it, and these may rekindle later, but they're not going to recognize me. But the, but the point is, um, what I'm trying to say is that, um, you know, you may have gone through a lot of change. And hopefully part of that change is actually me meeting new friends, making new friendships. Because these people aren't going to see how you were a year ago or so with, with the NARC. They're going to see how you are now, and if you've been working on yourself, or if you've you know you've been putting boundaries in place, they're going to know you as this healthy person or healthier person, um, and so you're going to meet people more at your level or the level you want to be or the level that you've already come up to, as opposed to um, trying to adapt to the old friends, you know. And you know you got some people or you know blood that blood relatives that will uh, you know you're never going to get rid of them. They're always going to be your blood. Um, and maybe you've had to distance yourself from some of them and maybe some of them you'll actually become better friends with because you are becoming healthier. And that's the thing. Healthy people don't even, they can't even really define it unless they really know themselves really, really well and they're, they can communicate well or maybe they're in psychology or some, some, um, uh, some part of psychology. Maybe they're involved, maybe they're a therapist or something, but most most healthy people don't even see what it's like being around unhealthy people. They they almost have this sense of just it just doesn't feel right. Something you know somebody's too needy, right? Somebody might say, yeah, that person, yeah, I didn't really hang around them. They're kind of a needy person, and so that's what that's when I know that's how I came across to a lot of people is that I look like a needy person because I needed the. I was starved for attention, right? Because the person in my life wasn't giving me that. But I, I thought I had to get it from people too. And I, that's one thing that I've changed a lot is now I get, uh, I, I get more of my, uh, my needs met from um, non-human entities. Yes, I believe in aliens. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. I, no, I believe in something other than humans. And I, it, for me, it's God, okay? So it's more spiritual for me. But, but if you believe in something strong, you know, bigger than you, like a Buddha or some spirit, um, spiritual uh, connectedness or the earth or something, something that's bigger than you, that has helped me a tremendous amount. And that's what I've read. I've read that in psychotherapy. So uh, my dog is chewing on something I don't know what he's chewing on. So anyways, yeah, I'm at the dog park and uh, so this is what my attention is on now. Hey, hey Bobo, what are you chewing on? Hey, what is that? Oh, great. Something crunchy. Hey, hey, come on. Come here. Come here. Okay. Come on. Let's see it. Oh, great. Oh. Okay. Okay, Murphy. Murphy. Okay. Oh, oh it's a bird claw. Hey. <laughs> I'm sorry you guys had to see that. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, that's a bird dog, so that's what bird dogs are going to do chew on birds okay so anyways so what kind of things can we learn from what you just saw okay the talons that was a talon right the narc has their claws in you now my dog has we're like the dogs we take the narcs back we just arr, we just chew them up right okay anyways that was gross so Yes, and you needed to be needed, right? And why is that? Why is that? Well, we learn it when we grow up, when we're kids. We watch what our parents do. Because that's how kids learn, right? They, they model the behavior that's around them. They just basically input it in with no filters, right? Nothing that says, well, that doesn't seem very healthy, whatever. No, when we're kids, we don't know. We just, 
that's the world we live in, right? We just suck it in, and that's kind of how we become. So if we see, if we tend to get our way when we're needy or we do something nice for mom, and then she's like, oh, that's great, baby, thank you so much, and we get rewarded for that, and then penalized, or maybe we don't get any attention when we don't do things like that, then we, you know, it's part of our personality, uh, along with, you know, our personality at birth. Uh, but that shapes our personality and, and uh, activates some things that maybe uh, we kind of hold on to. But it's good to be uh, thoughtful and think of others' need, think of others' needs. But it, but there's a point I believe that it's almost too much. We put ourselves, we put ourselves uh, way way behind other people. Um, because I get this little high too. I get this. I feel good when I'm able to do something for somebody and get appreciated for for it. And sometimes maybe not appreciated for it, but, but, um, but some people, it, but it's, it, it, but sometimes it can be very unhealthy when, when I feel like I need to do that. It's like, I, I have to do that to make somebody feel better, right? To change their state, right? Like if somebody's feeling bad, I want to go change their state. And for a lot of men, I think, this is more for the men, we want to be the white knight, you know, we want to rescue her. So I may see a girl that's hurting. And I think, wow, she's around me. I can make her happy, you know. But, um, you know, that, I'm talking about somebody who's in a a state of hurt, not necessarily, you know, sad that day or, you know, they get their car repaired and they've got a bill or something. And it's not, not, not something like that. I'm, so, I'm talking about somebody that has this. And, and I can see it every once in a while now is that when I, look at, well, when I look at somebody's face, I can almost see pain on their face. In fact, I can go on plenty of fish which is a dating website and i can look at profiles and there's little things in their face that that i'm be, i'm more aware of now i i can't put lay, labels on it yet but i can tell when somebody's almost the type of person that i would go i would go after i say well somebody that i would be attracted to somebody who's more in pain and i don't have that attraction as much i'm more i have more of an attraction to somebody that's um that has just a healthier outlook in their face, just the way they carry themselves. And sometimes you can tell a lot from a picture, right? A picture's worth a thousand words. So I tend to see that now. Not that I'm an expert at it or that I can label it and say, oh, well, this because of this. I just know from a sense, from a gut of kind of uh, what I'm looking for and what, what I feel like now. Because I'm more confident and I'm more, I'm able to express myself. And, I'm, and I want somebody like that, not somebody who's shy and reserved like I was eight months ago even. I was very shy. I was very, I couldn't, I almost apologize for taking your time to speak to you. Now I'm like, hey, if you want to listen to me, great. If not, you know, I don't have any, I don't have any, I don't have any skin in the game. I don't have anything vested where if you don't watch my uh, live stream, then I'm going to be offended or if you, or, or feel bad that, that you didn't, you didn't watch it or something. You know what I mean? Where, um, where before when I started making these videos on YouTube, I was just like, well, if somebody watches them, great, you know? And, and now I'm like, yeah, if you want to watch it, great. If not, you know, it's not for you, you know? Almost how a narc is. A narc doesn't really care about other people's feelings, but, but, we, but we, see, we can take parts of them that, that we, need, we need to do more of, and that's not be so hung up on what other people think of us. Because a narc really doesn't care, right? They really don't care. They don't care what you think. They don't care how you feel. They care what you think in the sense that it helps them, but they don't care how you feel, you know? Does that make sense? Let me see what some of your comments are. I'm sorry, I've got these bugs that are I'm outside here. So, Sally Fields. Sally Fields, they like me. I don't know which Sally Fields you're referring to. The Sa Was that the Sally? Um, I, I mean, I know who Sally Fields is. Uh, she's that actress, and there was a movie called Smoking the Bandit that she was in with Burt Reynolds. That was a classic. I think I've watched that 20 times in my, in my youth. Great movie. But um, Burt Reynolds was kind of a, he was a playboy back then. He was kind of a narc. I don't know if he's a narc, but he was, a, he, was, he, was, a, he, was, he, was he was the shit. Mommy, fix it. Yeah, we want, we see, and we want to fix people, right? We go around, we want to fix people. I mean, Oh, okay, so, so when I said that, did you think, 
Well, what's wrong with fixing people? What's wrong with wanting to help people? Okay, well, here's what I found that's, that's not wrong with it, but it's not the healthiest. It's good to want to help people. It's good to want to do things for people, but why? And what I found is that a lot of times when we focus on other people, it allows us to not have to focus on ourselves. That's where it becomes unhealthy. When we deny our own feelings, when we put our own feelings down first, when we're scared to maybe assert ourselves or say something, so we'd rather just hold back and whatever that person says over there, whatever the, uh, the other person says, that's what I'll do or I'll adapt around them. I won't assert myself, but I'll just kind of stuff my feelings down here a little bit. That's where it becomes unhealthy. That's where I found that if I'm more assertive, if I'm more you know, about what I want. Oh, but I didn't know what I wanted, right? When you live around a narc, you kind of like, you basically give up all your needs or what you basically wanted and you become their world. You become the part of their illusion. So when you go no contact with them, that's when you're able to kind of go back to what you want, go back to figure out who you are, who you, who are you without this other person in your life? Because if you're like me, that other person set up all the, the play dates or the they were kind of like the social, you know, director and, and, uh, they basically told you whether the, everything was good or bad, whether the family was happy or sad. And it got to be to an extreme where when I was relying on that from her and when she wasn't getting her needs met, when, when things were basically not as good as they were the prior year, we had a business that was failing, which was bleeding money instead of making us money. Um, that affected her a lot. I was, I was down about that and I kind of went into my shell. Um, so she reached out to outside of the marriage, you know, it happens a lot. Um, it was devastating at the time, but I mean, now I've kind of see it for what it is and can kind of put it in its proper perspective. But my point is that when you rely on somebody, um, you, you know, you begin to have this dependence on somebody else for, for what the social candor is going to be and what, how your, who your friends are and what, you know, basically what's good or bad. Um, and then that same person is basically betraying you. Yeah. It's not a good source to get your, um, emotional health from the best source I found is just praying and meditating, um, reading books because, you know, people in general are just, I mean, we're all selfish. Even, you know, even I can have the best intentions and give you everything here, but I still have my own perspective that I'm going to color it through, right? So you're not going to get, you're, you're going to get the best. I'm giving you the best I, I can of me and, and my things on how I see things right now, but I'm still, I'm still biased. And so, because I'm, I'm human, right? I have a different experience. And, uh, you know, it's funny because have you ever had that feeling where um, you can't please this like you ever been somewhere and you can't please one person there. There's one person, everyone else is thinking you're great. And one person's just like giving you the stink eye and just, just being rude to you. And you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. So you keep changing your approach. Well, maybe if I uh, went up and uh, offer them a drink or something, maybe they'd feel better. And then, then you offer them a drink. Or, hey, hey, how's the party going? Yeah. And then they're just even, they're still like, just, just, they don't even talk to you and they walk away. It's like, what? Here's the thing. They're biased. So they're, they're, they're going to, um, Maybe you remind them of their sister who doesn't speak to them anymore or something. It could, that's the thing is you, there's, there's totally things that are out of your control that when we're, when we're empaths, when we're these codependent type of people, when we want to please people, that you're going to get frustrated and you're going to think, well, if I just did this better, if I just did that better or... No, there's nothing you can do. Some people is just never, never going to be anything that you can do. And it's okay. It's okay to just not please everybody. People aren't going to like you. There's some people that'll hate you and there's nothing you can do about it. The narc probably hates you at some point, but narcs don't have real, they, nar, nar, narcs have rage. They have rage at themselves, but narcs don't have really deep, deep, deep feelings outside of their, their own stuff. So I say a narc hates you, but they, I mean, they kind of, they're projecting their hate, their rage onto you, more, most likely. But, but anyway, but anyways, that 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 um, that um, putting yourself uh, uh, last and trying to get everyone to like you is just—it's just you're just gonna be so down because the world is not 
and the world isn't fair and the world is made up of a lot of people that really just don't give a crap about you or or me I'm you know people really just don't people all they care about really is themselves and you know now I'd like to think that if you're more empathetic that you are going to have a richer more more uh, deeper experience in this world that you're going to really be able to experience love more than you would if you were narcissistic so because you have you're able to expose your vulner, vulnerabilities and that's part of what makes something special right if you if if you just got everything you wanted with just the snap of your um, fingers there's, there's no uh, you don't value it as much as opposed to having to work for it or or, or having to be Put, put, you know, having to expose yourself or put yourself out there as far as maybe emotional vulnerability, maybe some, because that, that's what intimacy is. It's being a little bit vulnerable. You know, maybe that person's not gonna not gonna say yes, or maybe they're gonna say no to you. You know, little things like that. I think that's what makes life really exciting. Um, I mean, there's like. I kind of look at it this way, and this is kind of me with my dating, right? I'm starting to maybe think about dating again. I don't know. But there's a lot of girls that I could just date. I mean, I could just go out there and we could, but, but they, don't, they don't appeal to me. They're, they're not, they're not, um, they're not con I, I don't feel like I could connect with them. And I want to be able to connect with somebody. If I'm going to, look, if I'm going to take my time with somebody, I want somebody I can connect with. So if I was a narc, I wouldn't care about being connected. I could just basically go out with anything, swipe left or right, say whatever I wanted, say, uh, oh, you you are just so lovely. Oh, my God, you are so hot. And I could take that script. In fact, I know a friend. I know a couple friends, actually. Um, I've known these guys for, for a long time, but they will take a script that works. They've tested it, right? They're like scientists. They, they take these scripts, and they work, and they put them in their profile, and they cut and paste, cut and paste. And they have different scripts for different girls. If a girl has blonde hair, they got a script for the blonde hair. Or they just change the, the color of the hair to brown. You have the loveliest eyes. I mean, just different things like that. So they're looking for the, the illusion, the image of what they can present. They're not looking for the connection. Although they think they are. They might fool themselves and think they are. I'm really connected to this girl, you know. How'd you meet her? I met her through a script. Oh, okay. Well, okay. That's fine. Um... Not for me necessarily, but um, okay. So I'm looking at some of your comments here. Um, so the last comment. So many positive lessons are coming from this crap. Yeah, it's good. Good. If you keep doing this stuff and not learning anything from it, it's it's really frustrating, right? And when you look back, like even a couple months from now, you look back, or maybe a year from now, you look back and you'll say, wow, I'm glad I went through it. Now, not I'm glad I went through this, but hey, I went through this and wow. I mean, I have a much, much deeper appreciation for life, for people. Um, and I have boundaries now. That's probably the, the biggest change is I have boundaries now. I don't just let everybody in. I really don't. I mean, I make these videos, but... I'm not interacting two way and letting everybody, you know, trying to please everybody, you know, I, now am I trying to please you here? Not really. I'm, this is more, this is more to, to share things to enrich you, not to please you. I may say, I may say things that a lot of you don't like, but I, you know, you, but you, you hopefully I've communicated enough where I'm coming from to know that if I say something that maybe sounds triggering or offensive that it's it's out of um, it's out of my experience and wanting to help wanting to help and wanting to please you know I think though I think those may be two different things and I used to think they were the same thing now if I want to help you it's more of uh, wanting to share and wanting to connect if I want to please you it's more of wanting to make you happy when you're sad, changing your state. See, if I help you, my hope would be that you're, you would take the information and it would help you on your journey. If I wanted to please you, it's to make you smile and make you feel good around me. And the last part, trying to please you or trying to please somebody is 
if it's done excessively, I don't think it's healthy. For me anyways, that's what I found. I have boundaries as well. Good. Picky about who I spend my life with. Yeah, and the thing with people-pleasing, see, so you got the narcissist with the illusion, right? The narcissist puts an illusion on, they put on an act. They put on how they want people to think of them. And when you're a people-pleaser, think about it. You're a people-pleaser, you want that person to be happy. Well, how is a narc happy? Well, they're happy when they're in their illusion. So how do you please a narc? You become part of their illusion. Bingo, you got a recipe for... Um, an unhealthy relationship. You got somebody who's a people pleaser. You got somebody who needs to be pleased. Right? Kind of 101. Videos are really helpful. I hope, hopefully mine are some, somewhat helpful. And I just, again, I just, it helps me too, guys, because I get to share stuff and I get your feedback on here too. Validation. Um, so... So yeah, so instead of, uh, so here's some things that you can do, some things that I learned. Number one, number one, and, and um, I, I learned this by accident. Actually, a friend of mine told me, as, as a girl who's a friend, and I know her husband real well, but uh, I remember I was talking to them about a year and a half ago, and I was apologizing. I was like, oh, I'm sorry, you know, well, she, she said, quit apologizing. You're just, she says, you know, she, she, she took me aside, she says, it really makes me uncomfortable around you. Like, she was able to express herself. That's a healthy person right there. She's a very healthy per person, and I'm glad to have her as a friend. But she told me, she said, you know, when you apologize, it just it makes people uncomfortable around you. She says, stop apologizing. I said, well, what do I do? She says, don't say anything. Just, you know, when you're going to say I'm sorry or something, just pause. Just don't even say anything. And I started doing that, and it became a habit of mine, or I unlearned that habit, and I, I would just be silent. And after about two or three weeks, it went away. So I'm, now I pretty much apologize maybe two or three times a month. And it's usually for something that is um, genuine. It's more it's something where I forgot something or I'm late or, you know, something like that. But I'm not apologizing. See, I was apologizing just for, for, for being me. And it was kind of a, it had something to do with my esteem level. You know, I had a lower self-esteem. And, of course, that's when the narcs have got us by the short hairs. And that's when we're we're probably at our lowest, right? We're not feeling good about ourselves. When we don't feel good about ourselves, it's really easy to apologize and oh, I'm sorry, whatever, you know, and uh, you know, because what we're what what for for me what it was was kind of a defensive move. If I apologize to you up front and how I'm acting or whatever, then you can't hold me accountable. You can't you can't hurt me even more, right? By saying, you know, well, you didn't do this or that. Hey, if I say, hey, 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 how, how's it going? Hey, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, you know, blah, blah. Then, then it naturally kind of drove people away from, from me. You know, people kind of backed up, not even knowing that's what I was doing, but I was protecting myself because, you know, I was so vulnerable. I was so beat up by the narc that I was just like, I don't, I can't handle close relationships. So I think that was one of the ways I was doing it was saying, I'm sorry excessively because look, if I keep saying I'm, I'm sorry and I apologize, you're not getting the real me, right? I'm, I'm hiding that from you because, because I'm, I'm putting this say, Hey, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, if, if I do anything, you know, it's kind of like a, a disclaimer, like a lawyer does or in those commercials, you know, uh, this may be covered, not be covered, you know, uh, three, six month APR, guarantee, you know, that's kind of like a disclaimer. When you apologize to somebody, you're, when you use apology in that sense, you're kind of saying, you're kind of basically saying, um, what you're going to get from me is what it is. I don't have a lot of confidence in my abilities to please you, and I may not be able to please you this time, so I'm sorry, and blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's kind of like what happens to a people pleaser. It happened to me that when a people pleaser can't please anymore, like I wasn't pleasing my wife at all, as far as you know how she saw it, I had to start apologizing for everything because I couldn't please her. So, and now I wasn't able to please all the people around me, including this girl. And she saw it. She's like, what are you doing apologizing? Stop apologizing. It makes people feel uncomfortable. So I hope that kind of helps understanding. Um, actually, I guess they are people pleasers. So, okay, I lost the what you guys are talking about here. Um, 
So yeah, stop pleasing people. Find something else that makes you feel good about yourself. Because chances are you've linked up people pleasing to having a sense of who you are, what you're all about, what life's all about, and it ain't. You can actually enjoy life very, have a great life without people pleasing, without trying to get other people to make, to change their state, to make them happy. And really think about it. I mean, if you look, if you look at control, if you, if you, have you, you ever done one of those hula hoops, you know, the kid's toy and, you know, you swing your hips around. Well, you have as much control over your level of control over the situation, everything is all inside your hula hoop. Anything outside of that doesn't count. You can, you don't have any control over anyone outside of that hula hoop. So think of it that way, right? So you're trying to please, you're trying to please this person and make them happy. And they may look at you and you may remind them of an ex-girlfriend and you have no, no idea of that, but you can't make them happy because you have no control over that. And somebody may be drunk when you're talking to them and you're trying to please them and they may just be ornery and just mean when they're drunk. I mean, you just, there's so much, there's so many things you don't have control over. So why base your happiness on somebody's outcome that you have no control over? So what you do have control over is everything inside the hula hoop. So if you can make that person happy, then how do you do that? Well, that's what everyone wants to know. That's a million dollar question, right? You know, I think it's just being true to yourself. Maybe, maybe redirecting what makes you happy by learning, you know, taking the time to educate yourself, learn what healthy boundaries are, setting up boundaries, setting up what you want to do, figuring out what makes you happy. And then doing that, then you won't try be trying to get that satisfaction from something that you have no control over. You, you you have control over you, right? So I keep hearing noises over there. It's like a squirrel or something. My dog goes crazy over squirrels. Murphy, squirrel, squirrel, you see a squirrel? Murphy. Well, he's having a good time. Um, so Sophia, you're, you're saying your husband couldn't even get the damn car for people pleasing. Maybe coverts are just different breed. Coverts, it's easier having an overt, not a covert, an overt. Somebody who, somebody who pretty much up front day one, you know, they're a narcissist. They're, they're all about them. To me, that's much easier than, than the coverts. Coverts are sneaky because they pretend to be somebody else and we treat them, we treat them with respect and all this stuff like they are like the people they say they are. And then they're not. It just jacks with us and we don't know it. At least now we have the knowledge to know that there's coverts out there and that if there's a few red flags, we can put it together, we can string them together, throw them into the narcissist support on YouTube or on, on Facebook here. And we can kind of figure it out. We can kind of break the code now where before we might not have been able to, right? Pretty powerful stuff, I think. So, and then what we learn is that, holy crap, maybe we can't please everybody. Maybe it's the other person that has the freaking problem. And maybe we were actually pretty healthy all along. And the longer we spend with these people, the worse off we're gonna be. Oh crap, I need to get out of that relationship. How do I go no contact? I need to go no contact. I need to just break it off with that person. Freak them and people pleasing them. I'm not gonna people please them anymore. That's what happened to me. That's what happens to a lot of people, right? The internet and this group and, and other groups like this, they've helped people kind of see the light a lot sooner than going to therapy and trying to make it all about them, you know? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, you know what your problem is? Your problem is that 180 pound person that you're You've, you've, you've uh, tried to please uh, to make yourself happy. Don't do it. In fact, instead of pleasing them, piss them off, leave them, get the freak out of the relationship. Oh, they're gonna be upset, but you know what? It doesn't matter. You think it matters. Oh, well, I gotta please them, you know. Of course, you're not gonna say that. There's other things. There's other language in your head other than, than people pleasing. You know what I'm talking about though. It's a feeling, it's this, it's this sense of I done good if I do this, if I change, make somebody happy, or if I, if I make somebody's day better, or whatever. Yeah. 
I know it's and it goes contrary. It almost goes 180 degrees to what we've been taught as a, as kids. So when we do it, it feels scary. Oh my God! If I do that, they're not going to like that. Oh, they're going to hate that. They might hate me. They might hate me forever. And you know what? If you do that, if you go no contact and you do that and you just walk into it anyways, knowing that they're, I mean, your worst fear is right that they're going to hate you or not speak to you ever again. Even though you don't, even though you know they're not supposed, it's better for you if they don't speak to you again because no contact is the best way. But if you do that, that's where you get that courage when you do that and you walk into that and you just freaking take it and you just go no contact with them and you just take the repercussions. If, when you get to the point where you say, I don't freaking give a flip what they do, I'm done. When you do that, that's when you know you've grown, baby. I mean, that's when you know you've grown. I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about that because. That is the point where you know. And somebody, I think Leah had posted something earlier today. And I think that's what she was referring to. Is that is that when you just don't flip and care what they do? When you said, okay, you know what? If you know if you like, I've had this where where the narc will threaten in so many ways. They'll threaten between the lines, especially the coverts. They'll drop these little clues like, well, you know, how would the IRS like to know about that? You know, it's kind of stuff like that. It's like, go ahead, call it here. Here's the phone number of the IRS hotline. I don't freaking care. Go ahead. Well, that shocks the crap out of the narcs, right? Because fear is part of their, their tools for power and control. They want you to be in fear. It's easier to control you. But when you don't have any fear anymore, oh crap. Yeah. They're, 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 uh, they're freaked out by it, by it. And most of it, you know, other than violent things, other than actual physical stuff, most of it is just, it's just tactics. It's just ways to f- keep you in, with fear, and power and control. But um, I'm speaking for most of you. Now, there are some out there, and I know there's a couple cases where there's actual physical, I mean, possible death. I mean, it's, but, but they have to have this fear over us. And that's what keeps us, with the people pleasing, that's what keeps us coming back. Well, we don't want to piss them off. We don't want to make them feel bad. Or we don't, you know, we got to go opposite. We we do opposite day. You ever heard of opposite day? I can, I think my kids had that in elementary school. We do opposite day. Today's opposite day, Dad. You do opposite day when you start, like, not giving into every little thing to please them. or Or, you know, you don't make them that cup of coffee in the morning that you used to. Why would you respect somebody? Why would you treat somebody like they're your best friend or whatever when they're doing stuff behind your back? That's what you got to ask yourself. That's when you say, you know what? My boundaries are that I'm not going to do this stuff anymore. You know, this uh, this is not me. I'm 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 taking little self-respect here. I'm just, you know, a respectable person would not let somebody treat me this way. So, you know what? Why am I why am I giving back to them? You know, and the narc knows this. They know. See, the narcs like to push our they 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 like to push boundaries because narcs don't really have any boundaries. And chances are, if you, the little boundaries that you did have, they will push those and they will test those and they will get past those and walk around them. And, and uh, you know, pretty soon, you know, you know, with a narc within a week and, and they have your keys to your apartment or your house and, you know, they're driving your car and picking you up and you're like, how do they get into all my, you know. Uh, so that's the type of people that I'm talking about. They don't have any boundaries. They don't have any boundaries. So, um And they, and it's weird because you see, we usually don't have the boundaries. We're, basically, the way I see it, and, how, and you guys might have to help me out on this, but the way I see it is, we don't. We're the one with the boundary issues. We have boundary issues because we don't protect them. We don't put up enough boundaries. The narcs have boundary issues in that they don't care about people's boundaries. They just stomp all over them. You know. But the narcs are very protective of themselves. But see, they don't have a. The way I see it is they really don't have a boundary around a true self to protect. They live in this false self world, and the false self, whatever the boundaries are on that, it's it's all jacked up. It's an illusion. So they do have a very big, four-foot-wide, concrete, reinforced steel thing around their false self. They have a barrier around that. They have a boundary around that. They don't let anybody into that. That's why they protect it so deeply. That's what I see. So, anyways, okay, well, I'm about to wrap it up. I'm going to take this dog back, get him some water. But uh, I want to say goodbye to everybody in the next minute here and just uh, 
keep the discussion going. I'll post the video up. You guys can keep talking. But, uh, yeah. You know, instead of do nice for something for somebody today, hey, if somebody's not treating you right, don't do it. Don't do something nice for somebody. That's asserting your boundaries. Okay, well, you may say, well, that's wrong. That's just, I'm, I'm a polite person. I wouldn't do that. Well, you've got your mind convinced that, okay, by you doing this act that you're a good person. Well, maybe there's things you're not supposed to do because you want those people out of your life. There's a way to get people out of your life, and all you got to do is be healthy, do the stuff in your hula hoop, and those people will naturally fall out of your life. Because you'll have too much respect for yourself. You won't want to do stuff for people that don't return the favor. Yeah, it's kind of selfish, but you know what? It takes being selfish, it takes being focused on you to get better. So what I'm saying is, to get healthier, you got to be selfish. you got to take care of you. And not worry so much about what other people think. You do that, and voila, magically the healthy people will start coming into your life. You will be attracted to those type of people. You won't need to please them because they'll already be pleased themselves. In fact, they'll probably be in a better mood. They'll probably be happier with their, with their lives. So you won't need to even try to please them because they don't need to be pleased. They're, they're content. That's where I think, that's where I want to get to. That's where I am getting to. That's where I, I'm at for, for a, lot of the, a lot of my time. I purposely haven't dated because of that. Do I want sex? Yeah, you know, but... Hey, there's a lot of things that come with sex, right? There's a lot of um, strings attached. So I'm not ready for that yet. I'm not ready for that yet. So getting there, but not yet. So enough said on that. Anyways, on that note, hey, love you guys. Have a great Labor Day weekend. If I don't talk to you in the next couple of days, uh, well, still have a one. Still have a great, great weekend. And um, enjoy your Monday off. And um, Enjoy the rest of uh, the little bit of summer we have left. Beautiful here in Texas, 90-some degrees. But uh, anyways, love you guys, and uh, no contact. Work on your boundaries. Love yourself. Put yourself first. Be selfish. It's good for you. All right, over and out. Bye.